I love CNC machining. It's just so cool. It sits right at the intersection of all of my favourite parts of engineering. I find very few things as satisfying as designing a unique part in CAD, designing the toolpath and machining strategy, and then watching that part come to life in front of my eyes as the cutter rips through solid material. The outcome can be a unique part made from beautiful solid material that could last a lifetime. There's nothing quite like it, especially when that piece started life as a chunk of scrap metal or timber that you get to save from the scrap bin. But the problem with CNC machining is it's always been hard to get into. The machines can be incredibly expensive, they can take up loads of space, they're so loud and messy. This combined with the fact that the software can be confusing and the learning curve is really steep just tends to put people off. That's why I'm really excited to try out this, the new Makera Z1, a desktop CNC machine that aims to make the technology more accessible without compromising on performance. The machine's relatively inexpensive, available for $899 at the moment on Kickstarter, which is a comparable price to a high-end 3D printer. In previous videos, I've used the Carvera and Carvera Air CNC machines from Makera, and just like those machines, Makera sent me this Z1 for free in exchange for making this video. So while I'll do my best to stay as neutral and honest as possible, it's worth keeping in mind that I didn't have to pay for this machine. In this video, I'm going to be testing out the machine by coming up with a few creative projects and a few practical projects, all of which are going to be machined from scrap material that I've saved from the bin. And I'm also going to measure the accuracy of the machine by machining an accuracy test and measuring it on an industrial coordinate measurement machine, and comparing that to results from the Carvera and Carvera Air CNC machines as well. I'm going to start off super simple and get more complicated as we go through the video. The first project is going to be a simple end mill holder. Very simple design, very simple toolpath, and I'm going to be making it from some hardwood flooring that I found in a skip. So this machine has a working area of 200 by 200 millimeters in X and Y and 100 millimeters in Z, which in comparison to the other two machines from Makara looks like this. So it's a fair bit smaller, but if I look back and think of all the things that I've machined over the last few years, probably about 90% of them would fit within this footprint. You can see on the left of the machine, I've got it hooked up to the cyclone dust extractor that they sell, and these two work together really nicely. I'll see at the end of the video how well this has worked throughout all of these tests. I'm using the 5 watt laser add-on to engrave the tool number into the wood. There's no laser enclosure for this, so unless you like going blind, you should always wear the safety goggles. There's also no fume extraction, so you need to run it with the window open and a fan blowing out all of the smoke. You can see that the finished product is pretty nice. The machine handled this oak and birch plywood excellently, with a really good surface finish even on the end grain. The laser engraving is pretty crisp, but I did have it turned up way too high and I burned it a little bit. This tool holder will help me arrange the tools for when I need to swap them for different toolpaths. This machine's got the same quick change tool system as the Carvera Air, where the spindle collet is released using this hand lever. You can insert a new tool and then the length is automatically measured with the tool setter on the bed. This system works really well and it's so much faster and easier than messing around with collet nuts measuring tool lengths by hand. But obviously it's not as good as the automatic tool changer on the original Carvera where you could just set something up and leave it going without having to touch the machine. Stepping up the difficulty slightly here, I'm now going to carve a mountain relief of a volcano from Indonesia. I'm carving this from some scrap hardwood that I had lying around, I think this is maybe beach. First roughing out the bulk of the material with 1 8 inch single flue end mill. You can see how easily this machine handles hardwood, it's not a problem at all. The cut is really crisp and smooth and I could definitely turn up the feed rate or do a bigger depth of cut. After the roughing, a quick contour pass with a 1 8 inch ball nose smooths everything out and makes it look really nice and detailed. Straight off the machine, the carving looks pretty good, the surface finish is really nice and the detail's good. I want to experiment with the laser engraver a little bit more, and I want to test engraving at different Z heights. As I mentioned before, there are a lot of downsides to using a laser on a CNC machine like this, but one of the upsides is that the machine automatically has a Z axis built in. Most laser cutters that you use, even high end ones, don't have a Z axis, so you can only engrave in a very narrow Z depth where the laser is going to be in focus. I'm sure there is some proper software that you can use to generate 3D G code for laser cutters. But I don't have it, so I found a workaround with Fusion 360. So I do my first part of the toolpath as normal, 
And then with the final operation where I want to laser engrave, I created a really thin 0.1 millimeter ball nose end mill with the same length as the laser focal length, about 12 millimeters. I can create a contour tool path with that and then I can simulate exactly how the laser is going to be moving over the part and whether the shoulder of the lens of the laser is going to crash into any bits of the part, which is quite nice. I can export the G-code and convert it into laser G-code by adding three lines at the start of it. M321 unlocks the laser, M106 enables the laser system power, and then M3 arms the laser. In this mode, when given a command like S0.6, it will turn the laser on at 60% power, and then for rapid moves, the laser will be turned off. I then, with the help of Mr. GPT, wrote a pretty dodgy Python script that puts G0s and then laser commands in the right positions in the G code to make the laser fire only when I want it to. And after a few iterations and nearly setting a few things on fire and a few crashes, I finally got it to work. So this is the machine running a 3D laser toolpath lasering contour lines at different Z depths. And at each Z depth, it's keeping the laser perfectly in focus by moving it further down which is pretty cool. This is how the first wood carving came out without the laser engraving. It's nice and detailed and it has a pretty good surface finish. Here's the one with the laser engraving. The effect worked well in the way that the lines are crisp and in focus and in the right location in relation to their height. But I actually don't really like the aesthetic. I think it's too detailed and it kind of detracts from the nice wood grain. Because I quite like this relief carving, I made a slightly larger one from a piece of oak flooring offcut that I had as well. I increased the feed rate and the depth of cut for this one and you can see it's still chewing through this oak really nicely. And this one came out the best. I really like the fact that the end grain is revealed by the topography and it's a nice little ornament to have on the side. About a year and a half ago, when I was testing out the Carvera Air, I showed you how I made a Python script to generate these wavy 3D models that I then machined from bits of metal, and I really like these models, and I want to experiment with combining these models with the 3D lasering method that I've just figured out. First, I made another wave carving from a piece of solid oak flooring. And look how cool this time lapse came out. You can get a cross section of the end grain through the wood as it's slowly revealed by each layer of the carving. I'm removing all of the material for this model in one pass just by using a full depth of cut up to 10 millimeters deep and then a very shallow 0.1 millimeter step over. This one also came out quite nice. I really like the fact that it's such a flowing and organic shape carved from something as solid as a piece of solid oak. Now to test the laser engraving method on one of these, I want to do one engraving with contour lines at constant Z depths as I did before, and then I want to do another engraving with parallel lines that then follow the curvature of the workpiece. I've got a scrap piece of pine wood for this because it's nice and light and I think that the engraving will show up as a nice contrast with the wood. Since this carving is creating loads of dust, I think now is a good time to talk about the dust collection system for the Z1 because I think it's quite interesting. The outlet of the spindle cooling fan also doubles as an air blast for the tool, clearing all the chips away from the tool and blowing them towards the back of the machine. The base of the machine is sloped backwards towards two dust outlets at the back, where you can plug in the dust extractor and all of the dust is sucked out of the back that way. I think overall this system works really well for a small CNC machine like this, because typically for something that you're going to run in an apartment or a bedroom, you don't want to have a big air compressor for an air blast, I also don't really like using dust shoes on machines like this because sometimes they crush into fixtures and get caught on stuff and it also makes it really hard to film the machine or even see what's going on with the end mill. You can see with a carving like this that creates so much really fine dust, there is some residual dust which stays within the machine and doesn't get sucked up by the dust extraction. But this is really easy to hoover out afterwards and I did all of these carvings with the door open and I'd say about 99% of the dust stayed in the machine and if you had the door closed none of it would have got out. After getting rid of all of the dust, I did the contour lasering toolpath, which was nice and uneventful. I then flipped the workpiece and did the carving on the opposite side of the wave, as I did in the previous wave videos.
then after that the parallel lines toolpath. And both sides of this look pretty interesting. I think I prefer the side with the parallel lines, I like how the straight lines contrast nicely with the nice swirly grain of the pine wood. By the fact that I'm running out of space on the mantelpiece, I think that's a sign that I should stop making useless tat and start making some useful stuff on this machine. So I'm really into bouldering and unfortunately on a recent climbing trip I got a minor fracture in my wrist, so I can't do any climbing at the moment. So to keep up my strength while I'm stuck at home, I want to make a small pickup edge. This is just a simple piece of wood with a couple of different slots in it so that you can pick up weights and train your grip strength while grabbing onto these small slots. I've copied the triangle design because I think it looks quite cool. This is a really common design online and this is nothing unique. So a pretty standard tool part for this is quite a simple part. First roughing out all of the material with a 1 8 inch single flute end mill. Then I come in and finish it all with a ball nose end mill. And the bit where the laser comes in handy is I want to engrave the depth of each of the crimps onto the floor of the crimp. So I've got 15mm, 10mm and 5mm, all at different Z depths. This is an example of using this different Z depth laser engraving for something actually useful. I can then flip over the part, finish off the back and this is what it looks like when it's done. Each of the engravings is perfectly in focus and really well aligned with where it should be on the part since it's all done in single setup. I had a couple of off-cut pieces from the triangle shape, so I had to use up that excess to make little mono crimps as well. These are for just training single finger at once. This is what it looks like in use. The 5mm crimp is way too small to be useful for anything, that was a bit ambitious, but hopefully I can use this to keep up my strength while I'm stuck at home with this cast on. After machining all of those projects and a few more, let's have a look in the dust extractor and see how full it is. After doing probably about 15 or 20 hours of wood machining, it's pretty much full. Let's check the filters, and you can see that there is some fine dust that has come up into the filter, but that's pretty easy to remove by vacuuming up with another machine. You definitely want some kind of dust extraction when using a machine like this. Most shop vacs or small vacuum cleaners for households aren't going to be made to run continuously, and they're also really, really noisy. I like that on this machine you have variable control on the output power, so you can set it to however much suction you want. And it's also quite quiet. I don't love the tinted compartment at the bottom, it makes it quite hard to see how full the extractor is, but other than that it works really well. So the Z1 works really well at handling wood, but how does it do with aluminium? In a previous video I compared the Carvera and Carvera Air accuracy on an accuracy test that I designed and then I measured it on an industrial coordinate measurement machine so that I can get really accurate geometric tolerances of all of the features that I've machined. So let's do the exact same thing again on this machine. Seems to be cutting quite well, but on first impressions it does seem louder than the other two machines. It would be good to test it with a proper decibel meter to get some actual data, but it feels like to me it's roughly 1.5 to 2 times as loud as the original Carvera machine when running the same G-code and the same tooling with an identical setup on aluminium. But despite the added noise, it seems to be handling it pretty well. It doesn't seem like there's a lot of tool chatter and the surface finish looks pretty good. Stiffness is everything when machining aluminium and this machine has fully supported linear rails on all three axes, supported by a solid single piece die cast aluminium frame, which makes it all really stiff and that's why it performs quite well when cutting aluminium. When machining aluminium, it does become really apparent that all the rails are completely uncovered at the moment, especially the rails for the Y axis. So many chips end up on those rails and they get into the bolt holes. And I can't imagine that that's very good for the linear bearings. This is a pre-production prototype, so there is time for them to address this in the final production release by maybe adding in some way covers or at the very least some small plugs that will fill the counterboards so chips don't fill up in there. Another difference between this machine and the previous two Makera machines is this machine uses NEMA 17 stepper motors, where the previous two machines used hybrid servo steppers with closed loop control. These steppers are a little bit louder and they're also running open loop, so if the machine crashes it won't know and it won't automatically pause, which it would do with the other two machines. In 
it's easy to snap off the small tabs holding the pot onto the stock and this is what it looks like straight off the machine. And to be honest, first impressions are really good. The surface finish looks really nice and the chamfers are super clean. So let's compare it to the other two machines. So first let's compare the wall finish. This is the Carvera, here's the Carvera Air and here's the Z1. The wall finish looks really good. It actually looks even better on the Z1 than on the Carvera Air and it looks quite similar to the Carvera. Next, let's look at the floor finish from the bottom of the end mill. When compared to the other two machines, I think the Z1 has a little bit more swirl marks and rubbing from the tool. But as with the difference between the Carvera and the Carvera Air, it's a very subtle difference and it's really hard to tell unless you zoom all the way in. So I think it's reasonable to say that in terms of surface finish on aluminium, it's possible to achieve very similar results with all three machines. But more importantly, what does the accuracy look like? I re-measured this part on the CMM at work. Let's take a look at the results and compare it to the other two machines. First looking at the two diagonals of the diamond, 25 microns oversized on one and 51 microns oversized on the other, with a parallelism of about 10 microns for both, which is pretty comparable to the results from both other machines. Next, looking at the central ball, the Z1 actually comes in the most accurate at only eight microns undersized. Then looking at this larger outer cylinder, the Z1 is 35 microns oversized with a circularity of 27 micron. Based on these results, it seems like the Z1 is able to achieve a similar accuracy to the other two machines. For a part this size, you can easily get plus or minus 0.1 millimeters, and it should be more than possible to get plus or minus 0.05 millimeters for most features. And I found that this sort of accuracy is more than enough for 90% of the projects that I wanna make. Also bear in mind that this is only a single measurement of a single part on a single machine, but hopefully it's representative of the sort of accuracy you would get of a machine if you were to buy one of these. Here's the full set of results for all three machines as they come off the CMM software. It's pretty horrible to read, so if you want to interrogate it in any detail, just pause it now and you should be able to compare all three of them. Accurate and precise machining of metal opens up so many cool project opportunities. I'm currently working on an improvement for my generative design Stanley knife holder that I originally made on the Carvera Air. I've made a cool three axis fixture and made some improvements to the design, so look out for that in a future video. I'm not surprised that the Kickstarter's already had more than £4 million of backing. I see why people really want this machine. I don't know if there's anything else at this price point that can achieve these sorts of results. If you're interested in purchasing this machine, there'll be a link in the description to the Kickstarter while it's still open, or once the Kickstarter's over, there'll be a link to the general sale of the machine. There's always a risk when you're backing a Kickstarter project, but considering MakeAira already have a proven track record with the Carvera and the Carvera Air, I think it's definitely a much lower risk than if you were backing a brand new company. So that's all I've got for today's video. Thank you very much for watching and I'll catch you in the next one.